Do you think of vaccine passports or digital health passes, which is a totally unproven concept, by the way, do you think these will become the standard? Well, Emily, thank you. Good, uh, good evening uh, for having me on your show. But if you just indulge me for 30 seconds of some background context, I think um, it's worth reiterating that the industry has been through the deepest and darkest crisis that it's ever experienced, and perhaps beyond the industry too. Um, we've had the virus, we've had the crisis for more than a year now. And somewhere at the beginning of this crisis, we all thought that this was a temporary thing, was going to blow over, and then it became clear that it was just going to be more than temporary, and we introduced testing. And then when it became clear that we've got to learn to live with this virus, then appeared vaccines. Um, and I think in that sense, we've come a long, long way uh, in this past year to begin to talk about a vaccine passport or a vaccine pass. And I think it's understandable that there is the excitement, the optimism that this could be uh, the tool uh, not only to reopen uh, international travel, but also for general uh, economic activities. But I think two comments are worth making uh, in spite of all the optimism and all the uh, enthusiasm on vaccine and, and, and vaccine passport. First, I think we have at least certainly been making the, the call that we cannot simply depend on vaccine and vaccine alone at the moment to reopen the industry. Uh, because if we did so, there probably won't be much of an industry left. Just by taking into account, notwithstanding the rapid production uh, rates of vaccines, uh, but also the distribution of vaccine, the rollout of vaccines, uh, the acceptance by some people you know, of uh, inoculation, and we simply cannot depend on just vaccination to reopen or restart the industry. Testing and a robust testing protocol needs to be, continues to be a, a significant part of um, uh, that piece of jigsaw that will reopen the industry. And the second point I think is worth making here is that um, it is not really just about a vaccine passport because it also needs to be a passport or a pass that takes into account testing or the status of a, uh, of a person's uh, health, uh, health position. But the concept of vaccine right. passport is, 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 is loaded, is loaded with a multitude of policy considerations and almost certainly uh, a, a multitude of policy outcomes because the ethical considerations are practical considerations that need to be, be borne in mind. Right. Certainly there are and probably will be plenty of people who don't get vaccinated, people who can't get vaccinated. We know the vaccine isn't being distributed equally. Um, number one, what do you think is the future of travel and business travel? I I've heard both sides that everything's going to come back just the way it was, even business travel. And, and, and I've heard other CEOs tell me, uh, travel company CEOs, they think travel will be forever changed and business travel may never return. Yeah, I think um, for, for, for the time being, and it has been for, for some months now, that the expectation continues to be that leisure travel will return first. And we've seen a, a different pockets over the last year or so uh, that leisure travel uh, has a, a degree of pent-up demand. Um, I think there is still a continuing belief that business travel will return, and certainly we are one of those believers. Uh, but to what extent business travel will return to the pre-crisis level that remains a big question. And uh, we think that uh, from talking to our members from the industry assessments, it's probably going to have a structural change of maybe 20% less, 25% less, just by the nature of uh, having lived through this year, using technology, lived through this year, um, through um, interactions by different means. But I think it's also worth pointing out that at some point, business travel is going to return to its robust levels, maybe not to the 100 percent that it was pre-crisis, but because, you know, there's a human nature that craves travel. And for business travel, it isn't just about the transaction itself. Uh, business meetings is also about emotions. Business meetings is also about relationships. So I think I think one has to appreciate that at some point. Um, you know, business is going to get up, uh, business travel is going to get up to that robust level, uh, perhaps not to, to exactly identical levels of pre, pre crisis. So, Jeffrey, how, what would you say then? What about travel do you think will be forever changed post pandemic? For example, will we be, be wearing masks forever um, when we're in those sort of confined situations? Yeah, I think there are certain aspects of our travel experience that will change. I think 
um, from a customer expectation perspective, I think uh, there will be more expectation of flexibility in travel uh, so that if, uh, you know, circumstances change uh, because of this new restriction or that new restriction, uh, the flexibility and the ability to change your travel uh, uh, itinerary, I think that will be one of the expectations of business travelers going forward. Uh, but also more generally, business or leisure travelers, I think there will be, I mean, it's growing now, the customer expectations of um, a more seamless and touchless experience, hygienically safer experience as they travel um, through 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 the airports as well as on board on board the airlines. And and I think you know um, I think credit has to be given to the airline industry uh, both within Star Alliance and outside Star Alliance in terms of adopting measures uh, that address the uh, hygiene, safety, right. and the expectations of customers.